All right, well, if I can ask you to return to your chairs and get your Bibles and open them up to the book of Ruth. If you're new to the Bible, that's toward the beginning of the Bible. Seven or eight books in from the beginning. If you turn to the right, you'll find it. Book of Ruth, chapter 4. Chapter 4, we're going to cover the entire chapter this morning, but before we do, I, I wanted to get us into the context of this a little bit by telling you a story. It's a story that, that many of you may already know. Most of you even may, may know this story, though perhaps you, you might not have put together the pieces in connection with this particular chapter. Around 1100 BC or so, uh, there was a woman who lived in the ancient town of Jericho. Her name was Rahab. She had heard reports of a large group of former slaves that had been in the land of Egypt, a powerhouse nation in that time, and they had somehow been released from their captivity. Their God, apparently, had broken the strength of Pharaoh by an incredible number of miracles and signs. Pharaoh's army eventually drowned when this God parted the Red Sea so that his people could journey through it, Pharaoh, upon chasing after them, was drowned with his army. At least his army was drowned as the waters returned to cover them. So this woman, Rahab, living in Jericho, had heard reports of this God, and she had come to believe that this nation, on their way through the wilderness, coming to her homeland of Canaan, bent on conquest, that this God was a God not to be resisted or fought against. This was a God to be surrendered to, to be believed in. And she made a decision that she was going to abandon and reject her own people, her own land, even her own gods, and transfer allegiance to Yahweh. And she did. And for doing that, Rahab was spared when the city of Jericho was destroyed. She was spared. She eventually uh, became a part of the people of Israel. And a man from the tribe of Judah, part of that people, married her. His name was Salmon. They had a son. The son's name was Boaz. Boaz, in Ruth chapter 4, the son of Rahab, finds himself sitting at the city gate of Bethlehem. He has a task that he is determined to perform, and he has a plan to bring it about. So let's read about Rahab's son, Boaz, beginning in Ruth 4, chapter 1. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. The one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So, when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, 
He drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and to Malon, also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. Rahab's son takes a bride. If you've been listening to the stories, you, you know, uh, just on a literary level, what a, what a beautiful climax this is. Ruth, the Moabite, the foreigner who swears allegiance and steadfast devotion to her mother-in-law, widow Naomi, after the death of her father-in-law, her husband, her brother-in-law, she is going to stay with this widow woman uh, until the end, past death, she claims. She comes into the field, she meets by coincidence, but likely not by coincidence, this man named Boaz. He showers blessing on her. Naomi concocts a plan for Ruth to propose to Boaz that he would act as a redeemer, that he would redeem this family. Very important to note uh, that in approaching Boaz, what Ruth and Naomi were requesting was not merely physical protection, but that he would fulfill this role of literally standing in for the dead. That he would stand in for the dead and thereby ensure that the inheritance would remain in this family's name. Boaz declares he is willing, but there is someone in the way. There is a legal obstacle. There is a redeemer that is nearer than himself. And that's the, the drama of chapter 4. So let's walk through it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk through this passage with, with four phrases all about redemption because that's what's taking place here. First of all, the question of redemption. The question of redemption is what is raised when Boaz comes to this gate. The first thing he does is he, he gets a quorum of elders. This would have been a, a sort of legal group, a legal represent, representative group. He gets them by the gate and he stations them. So it's very clear from the beginning, Boaz is not merely interested in, in helping Ruth and Naomi out in a sort of a on-the-side kind of way. He wants this to be a legal, formal, permanent association. Whatever's going to happen here, everyone is going to know about it. No more skulking, no more Moabite on the corners of a field. This is going to be public from now and forever. So he gets this quorum ready. 
You have to appreciate Boaz's cleverness. I mean, just on a human level, there's just a cleverness in the way he walks through this. He has all these witnesses, legal witnesses. Now, it, it happens to be that the man, the redeemer, of whom Boaz had spoken, you want to notice where it says there in verse 1, and behold, just like it said earlier, behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. Behold, it just so happens that the man that they're looking for wanders through the gate, and Boaz says to him, turn aside, friend, sit down here. The man comes and sits down. Boaz says to him, there is this opportunity, and as a nearer relative than I am, you have first right of refusal by the land. Now, at first glance, this is a prime investment opportunity for this guy, this redeemer, who intentionally is nameless in this entire chapter. This is a no-brainer deal. For the price of supporting an elderly widow, he gets to attach her inheritance to his own. And since there is no son associated with this family line, which is dead, this inheritance is not just going to be his for the foreseeable future until the year of Jubilee when they got to turn it all back to the family. This will be his likely forever. So he gets to permanently add to his inheritance, to his land, his land holdings, merely for the, for the price of supporting Naomi for however long, probably not very long, uh, she will be around to provide for her. This is a no-brainer deal. And so the man says, yes, I will redeem it. No kidding. I, I would, yes, I will thank you for letting me know. Uh, no, you don't have to worry about it, Boaz. I will step in and, and take this opportunity. And you can feel from a, from a literature level, you got to appreciate the Bible's literature, uh, the, the us, the readers, kind of groan uh, because you can feel like, no, like that. we don't want this other dude uh, to be in the way of the story. That would ruin the story. This is a little bit like uh, how it's supposed to be felt. But you can imagine Israelite children. This is their story that their mother tells them. And then the man said, I will buy it. And you can feel like their response is supposed to be, oh, no. And, and then, you know, what's going to happen? Okay, let's see. Now, Boaz, clever man that he is, saves the cost for last. The man responds eagerly. This is a no-brainer, but he says, but on the day, he says, that you buy it, you also acquire Ruth, the widow, the Moabite, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Important what he's saying, with all these witnesses standing there. Now, we have no indication that either this redeemer or Boaz was a brother to Elimelech. So I know this is a little bit like Israelite law lesson, but let's just understand this a little bit. Um, if a brother left a widow in Israel, the brother was responsible to marry the widow and their first child would be counted as the child of the dead original brother. Okay, does that make sense? Th that's part of the law. That's how they made sure that each clan had a continuation of a line. Nobody got extinct. That, that, that's the idea, all right? However, in this case, we don't have any indication that either of these guys are brothers. So here's what Boaz is doing. I am saying, in the presence of the elders, in the presence of this quorum, in the presence of all these people, I expect you to do the spirit of the law here and not just the letter. I expect you not just to care for this family physically. I expect you to stand up and marry this widow and to ensure that this line in Israel does not end. What he's demanding is that this guy express the kind of love that goes beyond the ordinary that technically this guy did not have to express. But Boaz is putting him on record that in his mind, this is the responsibility of the Redeemer. It's not the letter of the law, but it's the spirit of the law. We belong to Yahweh. You keep this family and in their inheritance. If you want the land, you make sure this responsibility goes along with it. In front of all these people, I'm declaring this is what it means to be an Israelite. You're going to show hesed, covenant, above and beyond the call of duty love, right here, right now. All these guys are witnesses. Will you or won't you? I mean, on a human level... Boaz is brilliant. <laughs> Boaz has made this guy, this is now a lose-lose scenario. If he says no, uh, then clearly all of the people there would expect, would expect that, that Boaz is going to do something because Boaz is the one that's declaring 
that he thinks this widow should be married, that that's the spirit of the law. But if he says yes, here's what it means for him financially. He has all of the cost incurred with taking care of Naomi and Ruth and a likely son or offspring that could take place from this union. And once they have a son, he loses the entire inheritance to that son. It transfers out of his hands and into this line, and he doesn't even get recognized. This changes the game for this guy. And so he says, I cannot redeem it lest I impair my own inheritance. Here's what he's saying. Look, now you're just talking about cost with no benefit. No, but this is very, now we went from this no-brainer, all benefit, little cost to massive cost, little benefit. I'm not going to do this. You're not forcing me into this, Boaz. Nice to see you too at the gate this morning. I'm not, I'm not marrying that lady, the Moabite. I don't care who you got standing around here. I could care less. I'm not marrying her. No way. This is going to impair my own inheritance. You do it yourself. And so they had this cultural custom where you take off a shoe. It's a way of declaring this person now has the right that I used to have. Uh, that'd be a little bit odd today, but it's what they did back then. Here you go. This is you. This is an emphatic, legal, uh, with witnesses, declaration. I relinquish. I will not redeem this family. You do it. Legally, no question, no retraction, no going back. I will not redeem them because of the cost. The question of redemption in Ruth chapter 4 is a question of cost. Will anyone be willing to go beyond the call of technical duty, beyond the responsibility of the law? Will anybody be willing to take cost? without obvious benefit? Who's willing to do that? And you can see the connection to the rest of the book. Isn't that what Ruth is about? Hesed love, covenant love that goes beyond, that sacrifices for the sake of another, this kind of love that that knows no cost too great to benefit someone else. So once again in chapter 4, we have this contrast set up. You have this person who is similar to Orpah in chapter 1, who's maybe not a bad guy, but he's not going to do this kind of sacrifice and love. And so he vanishes from the story, similar to Orpah. Important to see the contrast in this question as it's being resolved. This, the writer intentionally sets this up. The contrast between this redeemer and what Boaz is going to do. Very, very important to understand. Commentator Ian Duguid says this. Ruth chapter 4 is all about preserving names. You notice the names of virtually everyone, even dead people, are referenced in this chapter. And then there's a genealogy at the end of the chapter with many different names in this family line. Names are a big deal. Boaz is given renown by the people. His name is to be well known, in other words, in Israel. Names are a big deal in chapter 4. It's all about preserving names. Throughout this chapter, there is the common thread of the desire to keep one's name alive. Although neither Mr. So-and-so, he says that because there's literally, uh, almost that's the only way to translate how this person is referenced. Turn aside friend, it says. You notice that word friend there? Uh, They they actually don't even know how to, there's, there's just such an ambiguous reference to this guy. It doesn't even give him any kind of handle. I mean, we might translate it Mr. So-and-so. Turn aside, so-and-so. I mean, it's, it's like the writer, even if he knew the name, he's not going to reference it here. He gets no reference. Turn aside, Mr. So-and-so. Although neither Mr. So-and-so nor Boaz realized it at the time, a lasting name was what was at stake here. By trying to protect his future, Mr. So-and-so would remain forever nameless. The question of redemption is a question that resounds throughout the book of Ruth. The person willing to take the sacrificial choice, to take on themselves the cost for another person's well-being, that person will receive lasting renown. The person who is unwilling to go beyond the letter of the law, who is only willing to do what is reasonable, rational, and appropriate for their own self-interest, that person will not be worthy of mention in God's record. 
We've mentioned before that the book of Ruth has, has two points. A primary point is about God's redeeming love, working it out to save and redeem a needy people. That's the primary point of the book of Ruth. But at the same time, there is this woven in secondary point that says, and if you want to belong to the God of redeeming love, you should express that kind of love towards others as well. And in this beginning opening of the chapter, it's very clear. The one who's unwilling to do that is forgotten. The one who is willing to do that, he will be remembered by the Lord. The question of redemption is the question of who is willing to bear the cost to express love that is sacrificial and costly. Boaz answers the call. In verse 8, Boaz declares, or, or in verse 8, the Redeemer gives it to Boaz. In verse 9, Boaz declares, You are witnesses that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belong to Elimelech, all that belong to Kilion, these are the two boys, and to Malon. Also, also, very clear, he makes it emphatic, Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife. And here, here is the explicit sacrificial meaning and hope behind what he's doing. He wants to make it abundantly clear that he is not going to sidestep the opportunity here. I have done this to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. So in other words, any children, our son, our first son, he will be named, his inheritance will be named for Elimelech, his grandfather. I willingly bear the cost without knowing if I will reap any personal benefit. That's why I am doing this. I don't want you to be any doubt about this. I am not looking to retain this inheritance for myself. I am looking to ensure that it benefits someone else. That the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. And they go on to provide this incredible blessing on, Rach, on, on Ruth and Boaz. Here's what's happening here. The, the question of redemption has become the decision of redemption. So if you wanted an outline for this chapter, that's what I would put. The question of redemption and then the decision of redemption. The decision of redemption is this. Boaz says, I will redeem, regardless of the cost to myself, regardless of what will take place uh, for my personal uh, sacrifice in this interaction, I will redeem. I will do it legally. I will do it publicly. I am associating myself with Ruth the Moabite. I am not ashamed of her. I am not unwilling for her to be my wife. I take her into my home. And not only that, but our son will take their, his, his, his great-grandfather's name, or his grandfather's name, rather, and, and he will receive the benefit. I take the cost. They get the benefit. I take Ruth, and then the blessing that takes place only celebrates what Boaz has done. Ruth the Moabite is compared to Rachel and Leah, the founding mothers of Israel. Think, think, think about that. Ruth the outsider, Ruth the Moabite with the scandalous spiritual heritage, she is now being compared to these founding Israelite women. Tamar, the, the woman from whom this powerful clan, Perez, came into being. They're saying, we hope that Yahweh will bless Ruth in the same way that he blessed those women, in the same way that Judah is now this mighty clan, and this, this particular tribe is mighty and known in Israel. We're hoping that Ruth the Moabite will receive that same blessing from Yahweh. She is no longer an outsider. Not only that, we're hoping that God, in a particular way, blesses her. In a particular way, we're hoping that she will be given a abundant name and acknowledgement and fruit from the Lord. The decision of redemption, motivated by sacrificial cost on the heart of Boaz, leads to this prayer of God's blessing over Ruth. And that the future benefit to the clan and to the people will come through this choice of redemption is the prayer of these people at the gate. That's what's happening here. They're basically saying, Lord, your relentless love displayed in the past through this family, display now through this woman. 
your family creating, nation building, miracle inducing love that you displayed in the past, even through difficult circumstances, scandalous circumstances like Tamar, uh, would you do it now in this young woman? What you've done in the past, do now. Reveal your historic promises to build a nation that you told Abraham would be a blessing to all nations on the earth. Do that now through Ruth. You can only feel the historical connections being made. Look, if Rahab can have a Boaz, who knows who could come from Ruth? Who knows what God could do? And Boaz, may you get renowned. You've offered to sacrifice yourself. May you get glory. Unlike the nameless one, would you get glory from this choice? Would you receive renown and fame? Would your house be a mighty house in the land? What are they saying? God do something miraculous through this choice of redemption. The question of redemption has become the decision of redemption. There's a quote that is long, but it's just too good not to read uh, because of where this passage ultimately ends up. Ian Duguid again, he says this, Boaz was not marrying Ruth now for what he could get out of the deal. In terms of the financial and social equations, it was likely to be a losing prospect for him to marry a Moabitess, entering a relationship so that she could have a son to inherit the property he had just put out good money to buy could never make good fiscal sense. But then, listen, the Lord's wisdom operates on a different kind of calculus from the wisdom of the world. Part of that calculus is putting what the Lord thinks of us before what the world thinks of us. Boaz was more concerned with God's ability to give him a great name than he was about any attempts to preserve his own reputation. Boaz gladly took Ruth to himself, proudly giving her the same title from which Mr. So-and-so recoiled, Ruth the Moabite. He made it clear that the transaction was not about him and his own interests, but the interests of others. Listen to that language, not about him and his own interests, but the interests of others. That is, meeting the needs of Ruth and Naomi and preserving the remembrance of their dead husbands. This was not normally the way. This was not normally the way to win a name for oneself, perhaps. But in God's sight, Boaz knew he would always have a name. God's favor was more important to him than acquiring a name in the world. The decision of redemption. Let's move through these second two sections, and then I want to build the connections to us. The birth of redemption. In verse 13, faith and hope becomes sight. Boaz takes Ruth as his wife, She bears a son, and this son is given to Naomi. In other words, revealing the fulfillment of Boaz's intention that this is going to be counted as Naomi's own. He's laid on her knees, not simply as a declaration that she's a loving grandmother, but as as a way of declaring this is going to be the continuation of this line. Out of death, there is now life. And this son is called a redeemer. Don't be confused. The son is called a redeemer because, of course, Boaz is not going to live forever right? Boaz cannot personally guarantee the longevity of this line. He can't personally guarantee that Elimelech's name will remain in in, in Israel. But now that line can remain because now there's a future. Now the son can have a son and the son can have a son and they can take up their place in the gate and the son of Elimelech will now have a place in the land of Israel. And these women, if you remember in chapter one, I said, you know, when you're dealing with a bitter person like Naomi, it's not wise to correct them. It's wise initially to listen to them, to hear their grief. But now they take an opportunity to speak to Naomi. Blessed, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer, Naomi. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age, for, and here you feel the subtle correction, your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, 
she has given birth to him. The birth of this redeeming son reminds Naomi that the God of relentless love was watching her the whole time. That God's love did not give up on her, did not cast her aside, had more in store for her than she could possibly have imagined, has more for her than what she lost. The birth of redemption. And indeed, in this birth, the prayers of the people are fulfilled. Indeed, the house would have renown in Israel. Indeed, the line would be acclaimed in God's people. Because Obed's grandson was David. The birth of redemption brings Naomi. It's the last time we see Naomi in this story. It brings Naomi to the reversal of where she begins. At the beginning, we have Naomi empty, hopeless, and bitter, having compromised her standing in God's people, having journeyed to Moab and risked the loss of her faith. We see her unwilling to recognize the gift that God's love expressed through her daughter-in-law, Ruth, has been to her. We see her scheming and in a good desire, expressing a questionable plan to put Ruth in this place of proposing to Boaz. And then finally we see her in spite of all those places, now with a place of fullness, with a future and a hope. She has gone from emptiness to fullness through no well-being and well-doing of her own. She has come to this place where contrary to what was possible, remember her speech to Orpah and Ruth, if, if I had a husband tonight, Tonight, if I had a husband, even the most miraculous occasion could not secure a future for me. This is death. It's final. There is no resurrection. There is no way to come back from this. Girls, go back to your gods. Serve your people because God has led me to the place where I cannot recover. There is no future for me. Death has the final word. And contrary to all expectations, here she is with a crying redeemer on her lap. Oh no, Naomi, you serve a God who can bring life out of death. Finally, the goal of redemption. <laughs> the final genealogy of the, <laughs> of the book of Ruth, it's, it's just like, it's a little bit like when you watch fireworks and <laughs> You know, they, they have what you think is the climax at the end. Wow, that was a great climax. And then, and then they decided to just break the budget and do one final climax. I mean, that's kind of like what the end of, of the Book of Ruth is like. You think, this was the perfect ending. This is great. This is, I mean, everything worked out. Ruth has a husband and there's a son and Naomi in fullness and God has done everything and Boaz is amazing redeemer. This family has certainly been loved by God. God has loved this family. We should learn a lesson. We should learn. Maybe God will love us that way too. Maybe God who loved them so much would love us too so much. That's a good story about God's love. I, I love the book of Ruth. Well, well then, then the genealogy begins and the climax gets even bigger. He goes all the way back to Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. He traces the line all the way through Salmon, who married Rahab, the survivor from the destruction of Jericho, who transferred allegiance to Yahweh. And then he goes forward into the future because he's writing, looking backwards, and he says, yes, guess what God was doing? In Ruth, God was seeing David. Now, for an Israelite, there could be no more renown than that. That's as renowned as you get. Okay? Th that is as powerful 
a statement about the sovereign love of God working through details to bless his people. There could be no, I mean, the chance meeting of Boaz and Ruth, think about this from an Israelite perspective. David is the greatest of Israel's kings. He's a follower of God. He leads people to the worship of God. He defeats all of Israel's enemies. He's the champion over Goliath. He's the righteous king in contrast to Saul. He establishes peace for all of God's people. He brings about God's purposes by declaring that a temple will be built. I mean, this is the the height of God's redemptive love displayed in a figure at this time when this book is written. So for them, there is simply no way to not say God's sovereign love is beyond comprehension. When Boaz was meeting Ruth, God was planning David. When Ruth was loving Naomi, God was planning David. When Boaz said yes to Ruth, God was planning David. When Boaz overcame the objections of this other redeemer, God was planning David. When the son was born to a woman who had been childless for 10 years, God was planning David. God was planning David, which means God was loving his people in all of these moments when he was loving Naomi and loving Ruth. God was never just loving this family. He was preparing to love his people, to establish a king that would redeem his people from their enemies, that would rescue them from their danger, that would be a man after God's own heart. Look at what God was doing. So the book of Ruth changes from biology or or biography, rather, story to a worship book, a book of worshiping God's relentless love. (laughs) I mean, you know where I'm going with this, right? As amazing as it must have been for Naomi. She died before the full revelation of what God was doing could be understood. Those women were blessing God better than they knew. And as amazing as it would be for the reader of this several hundred years later who knew about King David to bless God for his sovereign love in this story that actually was his love towards all God's people, They were blessing God better than they knew because we read in the book of Matthew that Jesus Christ was the great son of David and that when God was loving Ruth and presenting her to Boaz and that son who was born who would become David and that God was then declaring to David, you will have a son who will sit on my throne and he will be the eternal king over God's people. God was loving every Christian who ever lived. He was declaring his kingdom purposes so that God does two things at once. He reveals the way in which he will redeem and he actually perpetuates the plan of redemption at the same time. You notice that? He reveals the manner in which a person will be redeemed by the way Boaz purchases Ruth and saves her from obscurity and even a scandal and brings her into this place of God's people. He he reveals the way in which God will do it. And he also at the same time is doing it by perpetuating this line that will lead ultimately to the birth of Jesus Christ. The sonship, the great son. Because God is consistent in how he works. The woman without children bears a son. That son is a restorer of those who had no future and no hope. The woman who's an outcast has been brought into the family and she is now declared to be the blessing, the pillar on which a mighty house will be built. And the government will be on his shoulders and his name will be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, And the continuation of his kingdom, there will be no end. Unto you, a child is born. Unto you, a son is given. When you read that genealogy at the end of Ruth, what God is saying to you is, in every moment of this book, I was redeeming you through my son, Jesus Christ. I was preparing the way for Jesus to come. You and you and you and you and me, we're like Naomi and we're like Ruth. Compromised, hopeless, 
outcast, without God and without hope in the world. No future and no hope. Nothing but death and nothing but extinction. No reason to believe that if something miraculous should happen today, that it would change a single thing. And God says, I can save the dead family of Adam and Eve. I can save them. I can rescue them. You know how I'm going to do it? I'm going to give a child to a woman who has not had children, cannot have children. I'm going to give a child. That child's going to be a restorer. He's going to redeem. He's going to provide a future to those who have no future. I'm going to love this people who have no future because they're compromised and sinful and they've wandered from me and they've been in Moab worshiping false gods, but I'm going to give them what they don't deserve to have. I'm going to give them a son. I'm going to give them life out of death. I'm going to give them a hope where they have no hope. I'm going to give them a future. I'm going to give them Jesus Christ. That's what he's doing. That's what he's doing in Ruth. That's what the book of Ruth is about. If you're reading it as a Christian, it's even better. It's not different. It's not contradictory from reading it like an Israelite child in rabbi school in the eighth century, but it's better. Oh, it was amazing that that led to David. It's even more amazing that David led to Jesus. It's even better than you think. The book of Ruth has two primary themes. God's relentless, beyond the ordinary, sacrificial chesed love is the chief theme. It's the hero revealed through Boaz and even at times through Ruth and her love to Naomi, ultimately revealing God's hands behind them all, weaving a story of his redemptive love that would be finally revealed in Jesus Christ. Like Boaz, he is the redeemer who says, yes, I will bear the cost myself. I will take the cost on myself. Like Boaz, he leaves his inheritance behind in his mind to go down and take on the cost of someone else's need. He willingly counts others more significant than himself in order to offer himself as a means of accomplishing someone else's redemption. That's how he is. He's like Boaz in this. He goes beyond the requirements of obligation. Jesus Christ had no obligation to save us. There was no obligation to save us. We belong to someone else. By rights, we belong to them. And that someone else was the devil and death and condemnation. By rights, we belong to them. They were our shepherd. They were our shepherd. And Jesus says, I will take the cost of redemption on myself. I will leave my glory. I will clothe myself as a servant. I will provide for these wandering, foreign, compromising people. And I will ensure they have all that they need now and forever. And I will ensure that their line never dies. And I will make sure that they will be with me forever. I will link myself to them without shame, without embarrassment. I will redeem. I will save. So what it means to you as a Christian is this is what Jesus has done for you. You've gone from emptiness to fullness, from outcast to beloved. That's what it means for you as a Christian. If you're not a Christian, it means you can. Ruth is an example of God fulfilling the promise to Abraham that any person from any background can come to God and believe in him and like Ruth can be bound to Jesus Christ who will save you from your hopeless status and bring you into a future and a hope with him. If you're not a Christian, that's what this book is saying. Believe in Jesus. He's a better redeemer than Boaz, but you can see in Boaz a little bit what Jesus is like, and he will rescue you as well. That's the primary goal of the book of Ruth is to proclaim the steadfast love of the Lord. The, the, the secondary goal is that as those who have received God's love, we have the privilege of reflecting that love. You notice how Ruth does both of those things. Ruth is at the same time an instrument in God's hands to reveal his love, and at a human level, she chooses to express redemptive love. Boaz is ultimately a picture of God's love, but at a human level, he reveals what it looks like to be one of God's people. Now, obviously, none of us is the fulfillment of Boaz the way Jesus is. But when we look at Jesus, our ultimate Boaz, we also should be willing to take the extra cost to sacrifice to love our brothers and sisters and others beyond the responsibilities of the law. 
It, it's basically the same logic that Philippians 2 says. If there is any encouragement in Christ, take upon yourself the same mindset that you would count others more significant than yourselves. In other words, as you look to the ultimate servant who has saved you, reflect his servanthood in your horizontal relationships. Love one another as Christ loved you. Not a replacement of Jesus, but in our small act of worshiping Jesus by loving other people. We don't save ourselves by serving. In serving, we reflect the Savior who saved us. We don't save ourselves by serving, but in serving, we reflect the Savior who saved us. Ruth proclaims both. Look at the Savior who saved you. Be amazed. Receive. You can never pay him back. You can't do anything to save yourself. You can only receive what he has done. Now, now that you've received that, reflect the Savior that saved you. That, that's really why we wanted to read this book as a church and to study it. Because we want to talk about what it means to love one another as a church community. We want to talk about that as a church. We want to talk what it means to sacrifice for one another, to serve for one another, to go beyond the rational, reasonable decisions that all of us can make, like Mr. So-and-so, to choose what seems reasonable. Not terrible, just reasonable. In light of who they are, do I really have to serve them this way? In light of how annoying that person is, do I really have to love them and have them over? In light of how they've continued to sin against me, do I really have to forgive them? Do I really have to be patient with that impatient person? Do I have to be loving to that unloving person? Do I have to forgive that unforgiving person? Do I really have to do these kinds of things? Well, technically, it's reasonable that you wouldn't. But if you believe in hesed love, and if you've been saved by it, it should be a joy to reflect it. So we're going to be going into a series talking about gospel community, what it means to reflect the gospel towards one another. But it's very important whenever a pastor or church talks about this. We are not the gospel. We do not save anyone. Our love towards others is a response of worship to the one who has saved us. Our love for one another is very important. It's an indication that we have been saved. It reveals that God, who is the God of love, has transformed our hearts. But we don't want to dis bring those two into the same place and say that they're the same. Our love for others or for people outside of these walls does not save anyone. It doesn't save them and it doesn't save us. But it does respond to the God of love who has saved us. So we wanted to kind of ground and build a foundation for talking about community love, community service, serving one another in a book that ultimately and mostly is about the God of steadfast love. So that that's our biggest point. That's our most important mission. We have a mission to serve one another, yes, but our biggest mission is worshiping the God who has loved us in Christ. That's our biggest mission. It really is not anything we do. It's really what he has done. And as a response to that mission, we love one another. Let me encourage you, if, if, if you doubt the love of God in your Redeemer, see yourself in Naomi. See yourself there. Because that's you. That's exactly what God did for you. He gave you a, a son a future and a hope that you couldn't have created for yourself. If you're a person that struggles to believe it's worth it to sacrifice to serve others, look at Ruth. Look at Ruth. In that moment on the road, it all made sense to go back to Moab. It all made sense. But she would have lost an opportunity to be an instrument of God's love towards Naomi and towards all of God's people and towards every Christian who's ever lived. And none of us is going to be Ruth. But in some ways, every one of us has the opportunity to be an instrument of expressing and revealing God's love to one another. We 
we serve the God of extraordinary, relentless love. Let's pray. Lord, I want to begin by thanking you for loving us. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving every Christian in this room, for loving us out of emptiness and into fullness, for welcoming us into your family, for weaving together the very fabric of history to lead ultimately to the redemption of your people. But we are in awe at you. And I pray, Lord, we would express that awe in part by loving one another. Lord, make us a loving church. Make us a church that rejects the reasonable, the rational, and moves towards the extraordinary and the sacrificial. Give us grace to reflect the Savior that has saved us. Receive all the glory, Savior. We declare that your name is renowned in this church, that your house is glorious to us, that the kingdom that belongs to you has endless glory without end, and that your name is above every other name, because you died for sinners and you revealed God's saving love. To you belong glory and honor and power forever and ever. Amen. Amen.